All right, friends, welcome back to your Vibrant Alive podcast. I am bringing on a very special guest today and actually one of our head coaches at Health Pillars, Logan Grundy. We're also trying something new. We are going to post this episode for the very first time on YouTube. And I've been telling myself for months since I've started the podcast that I want to get into recording the video and putting it on YouTube so you guys can see our faces and we can go into more detail and share screens and things like that. Anyways, today is the day. So on that note, welcome to a very special episode, Logan. I hope you're having an awesome day so far. Would you mind just introducing yourself um, to the podcast to our guests? Yeah, sure. I'll kind of, so my name's Logan. Obviously I live here uh, in Vernon, so close to you. So Vernon and Kelowna is where I primarily hang out. And then I am an acupuncturist, um, a herbalist. So that all falls under like the traditional Chinese medicine practitioner um, title. And then also obviously a health coach and I've done some training in neurokinetic therapy. So that's kind of like the big ones that kind of make up what I do. And then there's just a whole host of other stuff that kind of falls within that. Amazing. I love that. Yeah, you have a ton of knowledge anytime I have a question that is something that I'm curious about. I go to Logan on our team, especially when it comes down to anything pain related. Um, Logan is a really good person to ask and hormones as well. Logan's really, really good with hormones, um, but specifically pain. So is that something that you really focus on in your practice? Because I know you're really good at answering questions around that for our coaches. Um, Is pain management a really big focus of yours as an acupuncturist and as someone who works with, you know, Chinese herbs? Yeah, that's definitely kind of where I took things straight out of school is like, you go through school, you get this really base foundation of stuff. And then it's like, what interests you? What do you want to kind of dive into after that? So I've spent those first, I guess, we're up to like four years now, um, since finishing school on really focusing on that, because it definitely had an interest to me. And there were so many people coming to me with pain. So that's kind of where I have put all my kind of education into that. And then I've more recently started to branch out more into the like the gut health stuff, the hormonal stuff, um, and just all the other things that I guess kind of improve your life as a whole. So like sleep, managing your nervous system, stress, like gotten more back to the Chinese roots on that side where the mechanical pain can get very um, like Western or anatomical kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the other stuff gets a lot more deeper back to that Chinese medicine side. That's really cool. And I think that kind of leads you into one of my first questions right there is really what got you into acupuncture? Like what got you started or curious about doing your certifications? And then what are your certifications as well? Just for our listeners, so they have an understanding of where you came from and uh, what knowledge you acquired. Yeah, so it all started like super young for me. I've actually maybe only treated a couple people as young as what I started getting. acupuncture at so I started getting it when I was about 10 years old um I started just having some health problems where basically like that entire flu season from like let's call it September till like summertime I would just be sick all the time like if anyone was catching a flu it was me always would go to my chest so like coughs and um stuff like that so basically like what it ended up being is just like a really weak immune system but because I was always coughing the doctors kind of thought like oh he's got um, asthma, I was on like two or three different inhalers. Then they thought um, I had some kind of allergies, post nasal drip, all these different things went to a bunch of specialists. And really, like, as much as like that system was great, and we like tried to narrow things down, never really got anywhere with it. And we kind of got to this point where at one point, I was going to the hospital every I believe it was every four hours for a nebulizer, um, which is basically like um, inhaling medication. Um, and then that was kind of the turning point where a friend of ours who was going to acupuncture for like, I want to say wrist pain or something. She asked the doctor, she's like, Hey, so I got a friend and this is a story on their kid. Do you think you can help him? And he was like, Oh yeah, I can definitely help with that. So I started going for regular acupuncture treatments and it was probably like two years of regular acupuncture, I would say. I started twice a week for probably six months, then got to once a week and then every other week, every month, every two months, whatever, until the point where the following couple of years after that, I would just go in at the start of the flu season and kind of like get a couple of treatments and that would take me through um, that whole season. And now 
I typically like I'll catch like a little something, you know, just enough to like make sure your immune system's still there and working, right? Mm -hmm. um, but typically don't get super sick or if I do, I pass it a lot faster than what I used to. So that was kind of like the intro to it for me. Sorry, I get the drum out. Um, okay. And then from there, like, obviously I'm at this stage, like 12 years old, something like that. So I'm not thinking like, oh, my career is going to be in acupuncture. And I actually finished up school with like no dreams to ever go back to school. Like I did not <laughs> love school going through it. Um, but after a year of working, I was like, yeah, I should probably uh, go back to school. And I had always had an interest within like the human body and not like the more on the performance and the health side of things. So not just like that baseline, like level of care of just making sure we're alive and functioning, but just like taking it like that little step further from that. Um, so I kind of looked at physiotherapy and acupuncture school, both. Um, but to me, I think just having that experience with acupuncture is what kind of really drove me towards the acupuncture side of things. So then I went out to BC out in Nelson and did uh, four years of schooling for that and then another two-year prerequisite is what you need uh, in BC so was in school for six years for that and that kind of made up like the um, like the traditional Chinese medicine practitioner part of it getting registered all of that and then from there I've done just like a laundry list of other courses um, pretty much all related to sports and orthopedic acupuncture so um that basically boils down to like pain and performance, musculoskeletal type stuff. Um, so I've done stuff with a couple different people. One is a guy that's out of like Western United States. Um, and he's worked with the um, US Olympic team since like 84 or something like that. Like before I was born kind of thing, he was Crazy. already working yeah, with them. Cool. So he's a ton of knowledge there. And he, it's nice to like, work with him because he keeps a really like um Chinese medicine side to it whereas the other guy that I've studied under a lot he um he's traditionally trained as a chiropractor and then does a lot of acupuncture so he has a okay. much more like western and like um, like neuro acupuncture kind of background so like working with the nervous system a lot more so I've done courses with both of them on like the upper extremity the shoulder the neck um the hips low back and legs um so yeah, a couple different um, people that I've kind of studied under for the most part. And then I've done some extra stuff around breathing, um, scar tissue release and therapy on that because scars actually have a huge impact on our body. Like if we look at the fascia and how it can affect different muscle like inhibition. So basically making a muscle not fire as well. So that's made up the majority of the um, extra training I've done in the last couple of years. That's really cool. Yeah, you have a ton of knowledge. And now you just now you have your nutrition and personal training as well. So you are an absolute rocket when it comes to coaching. You are a golden nugget. Um, and we'll talk about where you guys can find Logan. I mean, he is one of our health pillars coaches. So shameless plug right there. Um, but he brings a ton of knowledge to the table. And uh, I know acupuncture is something that is done in person, obviously, and Logan is an online coach, but you can tell that his, you know, knowledge goes way beyond just putting needles in people. Um, he has a really good understanding of the anatomy, of physiology, of the nervous system, and of how to heal from a very foundational level, like really understanding the human body. I, I do find that with those, um, you know, older systems for healing, like Chinese medicine, we really see, you know, the effort in addressing the root cause and not just band-aiding symptoms. So when they were, you know, working on you when you were younger, um, between the ages of 10 and 12, were they, you know, can I ask if they were like tonifying the um, immune system, you know, through the different meridians or like, is that kind of their approach with that? Were they using herbs? Were they using food? Like what was their angle? Yeah. So with kids, typically what we see is either in Chinese medicine, weak lungs or weak um, spleen. So that's kind of our main digestive organ in Chinese medicine. So we can see that um, popping up pretty often is kids get colds really easily, right? Especially if they're born prematurely, which I was like a month premature. Um, okay. And then digestively, they tend to get the stomach flu a lot easier, right? And then we kind of grow out of that as we get older. But that's our body, just those systems starting to just fully develop a little bit more. So I think a combination of being born prematurely um, 
and then just that natural weakness that kids tend to have. So what I ended up with, it was basically like a deficiency or weakness of my lungs. So what we did was um, basically, yeah, a tonifying um, treatment essentially for the lungs. And then also we were working on that spleen side of things too a bit. We had me taking some herbs and then he also made some dietary changes at the time. It was like the simplest stuff, but the stuff that goes such a long ways, right? Like he basically just told me, stop eating a bunch of processed food. And that was it. <laughs> and that actually like, it was within like a week or two, I remember it of like switching over from like, here's your sandwich with some processed meat on it to like, I was the kid who got like the real chicken on his sandwich or real turkey or like roast <laughs> beef. And it was like, game changer. That's awesome. Which is so simple, right? Like a lot of times it comes down to these super simple things. And you see that with like Chinese medicine or like people getting back to yoga or breath work, meditation. It's like, Uh, we've known about these things for ages. Everyone forgets about them. And Mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, let's come back to this super simple stuff. Something I just came back to this week. And I think it was you. I mean, I brought Tyler Yarko on the podcast before the liver thing. And he's always eating organ meats. And I'm like, and then you putting liver in your burger on your story and then me learning about a little bit more about vitamin a like I understood it was important for immune function but I had no idea of its impact on things like thyroid receptors um vitamin d receptors and I've always struggled with thyroid and I don't know if anyone's ever prescribed vitamin a to me so I was like "Mm, do I want to buy more supplements or am I just gonna like go eat the source. So I bought some liver because it's the best place to get your retinol and And? it is nasty. Oh my God. I almost puked, but I did it. I like cooked it up in some like spicy, like chipotle seasoning and honey to try and like mask the flavor a little bit. I don't know. I think, do you have like a a meat grinder or mincer or something? Cause I feel like if you like minced it into ground turkey or something, it would be palatable. That is like that best way to do it I would go ground beef over ground turkey too just because I feel like there's more flavor there and I I always try and barbecue it too because I feel like that pulls Mm -hmm. more flavor out too like anything where you can add lots of flavor but what I do is you get because you know how liver is quite like thin right typically when you buy it yeah so you go buy it freeze it and then let it thaw to where it's just like a little bit um soft but still kind of frozen and that's okay. the easiest time to mince it up and then just make that stuff as small as you can possibly get oh my god I feel like yeah I, mean, I tried it. doing it cutting it by hand when it was kind of already like it, slimy and gross yeah, it's <laughs> so awful um anyways yeah. so I feel like you know, they were so getting sidetracked but I tried it last night and I like I was gagging I was like okay I can do this I <laughs> tried it raw I once <laughs> I had to like have you ever heard of the liver king he's this guy no. on instagram anyways you gotta look him to up look after up. this i will i'm going to uh, i was like have seen enough of the guys online and they, some of them will eat it raw with some honey on it and i was like Ew. let's try it like what? see if it's better than just cooked because like if you just straight up cook it yeah it's not good i was like maybe raw is not so bad yeah i was gagging that it's that so liver got gross. frozen cut up after that it was horrible <laughs> So, I don't know, Tyler told me he tried to make liver jerky and he put it in his air fryer. I was like, dude, how bad did your whole entire apartment smell? Like, that's so gross. <laughs> Anyways, back to our conversation. So we, yeah, back to the basics, you guys, is, is a really, really important factor of your health. You know, like getting good sleep, eating less processed food. And like Logan just said that, like one of the things that his practitioner recommended, his acupuncture acupuncturist recommended was eating less processed food and that's something that we can all do right um I do believe though that our body can get stuck in loops feedback loops where it's like a domino effect and something knocks something else out of balance and then things like acupuncture where we can I guess stimulate or effectively spark or encourage a system to start operating again is that kind of where an appropriate yeah. way to describe it like kind of give it a little jump start or redirect energy I guess um tonify is a good word so on that note why don't we talk about what acupuncture is and how it works because I'm obviously doing a terrible job in butchering how it it works and I think you probably do a better job of explaining it I'm like talking about electrical circuits over here I mean I do a lot of electric acupuncture so you're not too far off But yeah, a lot of times I'll explain it to people, especially with like that pain related stuff or like 
muscle imbalances that it needs that reset. And literally that's what we're doing is like hitting that reset button for it. Um, whereas when we get into more of the like internal medicine thing, it's more of that, I would say like a balancing act versus like a reset, if that makes sense to differentiate those. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so if we break it down into like two categories, if we're talking specifically about pain, um, then there's a couple things that will cause muscle inhibition, which is basically causing a muscle to not fire, um, either as strongly or like the correct timing of what it should be. Um, so like less than hundred percent of like where we want it to be. So those are either there's pain in an area that's causing that, um, there's a mechanical issue going on. So whether that's like, we had an acute trauma, like take a car accident or you were playing a sport and got like hit by a baseball or a hockey puck or something, right. And have like, say a big bruise that's going to do it or repetitive stress. So somebody that's at a computer desk all day or something like that. Um, and then also changes to a joint. So as we age like that, um, osteoarthritis, that kind of stuff, those are all going to cause muscle inhibitions. And that's a huge part of what we're working on changing is that muscle inhibition so that all the muscles are working um, together and in a balanced way. So when we have pain, we get at this release of like basically like this chemical soup that's made up of a couple main things. So that's like a neurogenic inflammation. So that's the nervous system basically releasing inflammation into the area. And that soupy kind of mix of chemicals that we get is literally like kind of sticky in nature. So, you know, when people would say like, oh, my shoulder's gummed up or it's stiff or like, I feel like there's adhesions in there. That's actually what's happening is like when that inflammation stays in that area longer than it should, it eventually starts to get like sticky through there. So we want to stop that like inflammatory response there. Um, so how we do that is by like resetting that muscle. So there's both a, um, it's called like nociception and non nociceptive signals. So that's like painful or not painful essentially. So if we have pain in an area, then that is going to send that signal up to the brain. Hey, there's pain here. We have that release of chemicals in that area and we want to break that cycle. So what we do is basically put that needle in um, along that like line between where that pain signal is coming from and the brain, get that needle in there and then send a signal that's not painful. So whether that's just the needle in there or adding an electroacupuncture to it, where you get a pulse of that muscle and the muscle, the brain then sees, hey, this muscle's contracting and relaxing, but it's not painful. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, oh, we're fine here. We can go back to acting how we should and normal. And then it's all, oh, it takes that compensation pattern that we're having because of the pain and sets it back to normal or like resets it. That's cool. Yeah. I, you know, Christina, Christina Adams, um, she owns Vital Point Acupuncture in Kamloops now. Her and I lived in New Zealand together. She actually had her yoga teacher training at the time and I hadn't done mine yet. She got it just before we went to New Zealand and she was my kind of foot in the door for yoga because she used to teach yoga to our house. We had like 12 people in the same house. And that was kind of my inspiration to start yoga. But you know, Christina, through acupuncture school, you guys went to school in Nelson together from what I understand. And yeah. uh, I used to be her little pin cushion. <laughs> she was going to school. I used to let her stick needles in me and electrodes and things like that. Yeah. And I remember her doing that on my back. You get some pretty good muscle twitches out of that, um, yeah. especially in some of those, you know, overactive or tense muscles. You put a needle in there and attach some electricity and it really jumps around, but it helps. It really helps mm -hmm. with the pain. And that's like a very, like, kind of almost Western explanation of it, of like, here's the nervous system, here's the muscles. And if we want to look at it as more a Chinese medicine standpoint, that we see that pain as like, there's a saying that where there's pain, there's stagnation. So basically the blood flow, the chi flow, that kind of stuff isn't flowing as smoothly through that area. So we should have smooth flow all through our body. You have pain in an area, you kind of get that blockage. So I like to describe that to people as like, um, you're driving down the road and there's a car accident or everyone's trying to make a left-hand turn or something where there's congestion on that road, that's that injury site. And then, so we need to clear that out, right? So whether that's like, if we take the idea of a car accident, it's like, okay, we need to get tow trucks in here. We need to um, get the, like an ambulance in here to take people away, take that local um, congestion away. But then also we'll see people sometimes needling distally. So if you say have back pain and somebody puts a needle in down by your ankle, you're like, well, this makes no sense. <laughs> but then it does if you take it to the idea of like, okay, the road's been closed off on each end because of this accident, right? So you mm -hmm. clean up that local area and then open the road back up on the ends to let that flow of traffic back through. 
Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. That's, that's really cool. So, um, I've done my touch for health, which is, I guess yeah. a body talk kind of thing for, uh, I've done all four levels and it does use a 14 meridian system. So when we're talking about acupuncture, I know they go a lot. There's probably a lot more going on there, but do you guys use a similar meridian system for like energy pathways? Yep. So we have like all our main meridians and what we have our, what we call our extraordinary meridians. So there's kind of the ones that relate to organs that are our main 12. And then we have our extraordinary ones that are just kind of through the body, but don't actually relate to organs as strongly. Um, so that's where we take like more of that internal medicine side of things. So you can think of these meridians as having like layers to them. So that pain type stuff is that more superficial layer. So our muscles, our fascia. And then when we get deeper into the body, that's that more internal medicine where we're connecting to different organs of Chinese medicine and working more on those meridians or channels and balancing those out. So typically what we're looking for is you're going to um, be asked a whole bunch of questions to kind of get a good idea of what's going on in your body. And then you're going to have a look at your tongue, which also tells us a lot, uh, especially digestively, I find, and about your metabolism. So take a look at your tongue and then check your pulses as well, because we have different like spots within that pulse tell us um, things about different organs. So you're getting in this whole picture of like what's going on in this person's body. And that's where you're really trying to get down to that root cause that we talked about versus that superficial thing. Um, so once you do that, then it's like, okay, now we need to go and balance these organs out. That's where the imbalance is with this person. And then you're selecting points based on that. So you're picking different channels or ones that you know are going to affect different organs and needling those points. And that's less about that, um, like specific muscles versus we're trying to affect the bigger system here of the meridians and the organs, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So basically on just a little recap, because Logan does, he, he explained both kind of sides of, of acupuncture, but you will see um, acupuncture being used in say, for example, like, um, like my physio used um, needling. Um, yeah. And then you'll, you'll also see acupuncturists who are treating pain from that kind of like Western medicine side um, where we were more talking about like the stimulating um, or resetting the nervous system versus the Chinese medicine, which is more looking at like the energy meridians. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. 100%. And with physios, typically what they're doing is needling anatomically based on like this muscle is affected. And then they're usually needling um, trigger points for the most part, then that's basically like a tight band or not that they're needling. And that's why you get that mm -hmm. jump response out of it. Whereas Just, they're not ugh. going to, it's not going to make sense to them in their system to go needle down at my ankle typically for that back pain. If we're no, using no, it. they're going right into the muscle that hurts. Like I used to exactly. get my physio and white horse used to love needling my neck. <laughs> that was like the worst <laughs> needles in here. Not a fan. Yes. And my scat, I think it was my scat. Anyways, needles along the, the spine or neck. I always find I'm like so jumpy in that area. Yeah. yeah. I think that was my next question. Like, can you explain what if, if someone has never had acupuncture before and they're terrified of needles? I mean, I'm not terrified of needles. I have tattoos everywhere, but it's like, what, how would you explain the pain to them? Yeah. Um, so I like to start by telling people just how small they are. So you can fit 21 like regular sized acupuncture needles into the tip of a typical like hypodermic needle. So when you're getting like a vaccine or drawing blood or something, you can stick 21 of those into the end of that. Like that's how small Whoa. they are. So people get all worried about needles and think like, oh, it's going to hurt so much. But then I'm like, it's 121 of the size of it. 21st. How do you say yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> um, I honestly anyways. like never really feel the prick of the needle. It yeah. is, it's kind of like the way I explain the feeling of it. It's like, it's like a dull ache once it's in the right place. Like if they put a needle in you and you, it's not like, I know Kristen used to practice on me. It like, do you want to feel that kind of dull ache? Cause she'd ask me like, can you feel like a dull ache here? I'm like, yes. And if and it was a no, then she'd kind of change the place of the needle. Like, are you yeah. looking for that feeling? Depends. So it can be like a yes or a no there. So what you'll feel is the insertion of the needle. You'll typically feel nothing or you'll feel that tiny bit of a like prick as it goes through the skin. So when you feel that little prick, it's that surface like skin receptor picking up on it. 
So that's what that is. Otherwise, it's going straight through and you're not feeling the insertion of it. And then once it's where we want it to be, often you'll get a release, for, like a, a neurochemical like release, and that's that achy feeling, mm -hmm. or you'll get different sensations at different points. And that's that um, in that specific location, you're going to get slightly varying um, sensations, essentially. And that's in Chinese medicine, what we call the qi. So that's like arrival of the qi at the point. Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends on the person that you're treating and what your goal with treatment is like take somebody who's really old and frail you're not going to go as aggressively as say someone who's young and really robust right so someone who's young you might be able to accomplish more in that treatment and like um stimulate the point stronger than someone who's really weak and deficient kind of thing where you just need to get them in really gently and let the acupuncture just kind of do its thing without stimulating it too heavily. So you'll get different responses. Typical is um, either that little muscle jumps, so that little twitch of the muscle, um, a achiness, kind of a heaviness. I would say those are the main three. Sometimes you'll get these almost, it's really hard to describe, but it feels like literally like things moving, like an energy movement. If you're somewhat in tune with your body and it's that one's just like so hard to explain and people will just be like I didn't just feel something around there and it feels like things are moving but it's like how do you describe that um there's not as good a wording for it as like oh it's it's achy it's heavy mm -hmm. well I think that as well with acupuncture you know we're not really that in tune with the little shifts of our body we're so out of tune with all the electrical frequencies and things around us, cell phones, televisions, noise, music. We're always paying attention to external stimulus. We're not very practiced at paying attention to internal stimulus. And so I think when you're laying in a quiet room with someone putting needles into you, all of a sudden your awareness is very much on your physical body and the sensations and feelings. So I think it is a really, really good way um, to even just kind of connect your mind body to go do an acupuncture session, I think, and really pay attention to the the subtle sensations that you experience, because I always notice shifts and, you know, deeper sense of awareness around what's going on as well. So that's another benefit from it, for sure. And at least from my perspective, I think just think we're so disconnected. <laughs> yeah, I think like there's so much disconnect with how we feel about our body. And like, we can simplify that so much easier to people at home is like, go grab a foam roller, things that you didn't think were sore. Like if you're just sitting here right now, your quad isn't sore, you put a foam roller on it and it's suddenly like, oh, that's sore. Oh, that spot's more sore than that spot. Mm -hmm. And like day to day, we're so out of touch with that. And then if you get even more specific and run your thumb along your leg, it's like, oh, I can really pinpoint it to that's the one spot that's doing it. And the more that you're able to kind of get back to your body and feel those things, or if we're talking about pain, or if we're talking about digestion, it's like, well, when I eat this, how does it make me feel? And same with like, when you're in the treatment, like, when that needle goes in, how does that make me feel like those kind of things, right? Yeah, I know both of us being nutrition coaches, I think as well, we ask clients to cut things out, like, hey, let's just eliminate maybe it's a nightshade or maybe we're taking out gluten or we're taking out like non-fermented dairy for a while and then that client has that food again and they go oh my god I had such a bad headache or I had such a bad dish or so gassy I was like you were like that all the time before yeah. you took that out and you just it was your normal right I also think that our baseline our normal based on eating a lot of processed food not getting good quality sleep always being exposed to blue light our normal our baseline is so low and then by doing some of these simple things practicing breathing moving your body more eating less processed food cutting out some gluten for a while you shift your baseline and all of a sudden now that deficit of energy or that deficit of mood balance is so big between your baselines or your baseline and where it was before that you notice that drop whereas it didn't drop any further because you were sitting so low does that make sense yeah yeah so like, see... the, the contrast yeah I see a lot of people that I'm always trying to explain like stress to them and not just like, oh, I'm stressed kind of stress, but like stressors as a whole on our body. And like, I get a lot of people that come in yeah. and they're just like, oh, I'm stressed. And like, I get a relax when I come in here and it's like, that's great. But also everything is a stressor in your body. And like when they say like, oh, I have so much more energy when I cut this food out, when I change this thing, that thing, it's like, cause those are all stressors on your body that your body was fighting. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can remove those little stressors, like how much better does your life get? 
because you don't, you're not fighting those stressors. And then you can start to create stressors with like a workout or something. Positive stressors. Yeah. You stress. And we should probably do a podcast on stress. Let's, uh, let's kind of line one of those up together because it is such an expansive conversation and I've done, um, presentations and stuff like for the university of TRU, I used to do lunch and learns there for their faculty and staff, just go in and talk about nutrition and training and health. And I talked about stress management and we did this big workshop on it. And I was talking about how like you have a bucket for stress, right? And it's going to start overflowing at some point. Your body doesn't have enough resources to maintain all of the stress that you're collecting, but we can't just look at all stress as negative, right? Like you are studying for an exam. You might feel stressed about that, but that we could look at that as a you stress, you know, your growth, your learning, your expanding, your knowledge, going to the gym. That is absolutely a stress on your nervous system and on your body, but it's helping you to build and grow muscle. But now if we start dumping other things into that bucket of stress as well, we're not able to recover from the positive stresses or the you stressors. And those are just causing further overwhelm. So I think for a lot of people, it's not about just pushing harder in the gym. <laughs> like sometimes it's about taking some things out, right? Training with less frequency or less intensity. Sometimes we need to reduce the volume. Sometimes we need to, um, you know, look at other aspects of your life. Like, is there a lot of inflammation in your diet? How are your relationships? You know, how is your perception of stress? Perception of stress is huge too, right? It's like, you could come to me and say that you're stressed about something that I might laugh at, right? So stressed because someone flipped me off in traffic this morning. Who cares? (laughs) You know? So I think that sometimes it's just as simple as helping people to learn how to shift their perception of stress. One of my favorite things with clients is to just be like, is it stressful or is it challenging? challenges we can adapt to. Like we all love a challenge. We all love that kind of, you know, encouragement to grow in some way, but stress makes us want to like cover up and hide. So yeah, I think stress should probably be our next podcast together. I would love that. Last question I have for you actually have kind of have two. I know this question is going to be an, it depends question. Everything health related is always, it depends. Um, but how often should you go? And then can you briefly touch on acupressure versus acupuncture? Because you know, for some people learning a little bit of acupressure could help them between acupuncture sessions. And it could also be a really good tool for them for traveling, or if they maybe don't have the the financial ability to get to an acupuncturist, or even for your own clients, you know, if they have pain, helping them to manage pain through acupressure. Can you explain the difference? Yeah. So as you said, it depends. Um, with the acupuncture, I would say, like, break it down into like a really simple model of if it's something that's acute and has just started happening, you probably need less sessions, but closer together. And then if it's something, say, if it's something that you've accumulated over five years, it's not going away tomorrow. So that's something where it's like, okay, we're going to have it more spaced out and over a longer period of time to manage it. So I've had people where I treat them one or two times because they like, they're like, I slept funny last night and my neck's all jacked up. One to two treatments, done. Don't come back unless something comes back up. Whereas somebody's like, I've had chronic gut issues for the last 10 years. Well, we need to do a couple things. Like we need to work on what you're putting into your body, like diet, um, like nutritionally, like what's causing that inflammation and then causing that like reset of the digestive system. And that at that point, we're at a deficient state within the body. Um, when we're looking at the organs of Chinese medicine and digestion, and we need to bring that back up and that's not going to happen overnight. So that's where we get you on some herbal supplements, make sure your diet's good, and then use the acupuncture over that broader period of time. So more sessions, but over a bigger period of time to kind of slowly step that back up. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a breakdown of like, how often do you need to go? Totally dependent on what it is. Um, So think more like chronic things that have built up over a long period of time, more sessions, more time, acute stuff, a couple sessions really close together, get it over with, move on kind of thing. Cool. Love that. And then, yeah, acupressure, because you did a really awesome acup, or no, Christina, sorry. (laughs) You did our Chinese, uh, Chinese food, um, eating seasonally, but acupressure was something that Christina taught at our client retreat. And, um, I know that it was something that you kind of put into our community guides in our private Facebook group as well. Um, so acupressure, what is it and can it be used in conjunction with acupuncture? So basically what it is, is we're looking at the same acupuncture points that we would be needling, but now we're just stimulating them with our thumb or our hand, whatever. Um, so basically we're getting 
that same stimulation to the point, but probably a lesser degree of it than what we can get when we put the needle in. And we're going to get some physiological changes that with the needle that we don't get just by hand, but you're still going to be able to um, get a response from that point, essentially. So that's where it's back to like that chronic person it's probably going to be beneficial for you to stimulate those at home. Same with when you go to your physiotherapist and they give you corrective exercises to do at home. It's like, you need to do something outside of this one hour of your week that you're getting acupuncture to help support your body. So that's where the like acupressure comes in. Or like you said, like you're traveling and you have a headache. Well, you can either pop a Tylenol or you can go get acupuncture or which like, that's going to be a tough one on the road, finding somebody and making the stop. Right. But if you just have your hand, you can just like, okay, I'll massage some of these points. And that's probably enough to take you past that threshold of having the headache, right? Mm -hmm. Is it going to correct everything that's leading to you having a headache? Probably not. But it, like pain in that sense, or like any symptoms that are like very obvious symptoms are kind of like hit that threshold of, oh, I have pain. I don't have pain. It's not like as soon as the pain goes away, the problem goes away. Or as soon as you're, say, if you have constipation that as soon as you have a bowel movement your issues are resolved right it's just like you're just tipping that needle just a little bit back and forth out of that like symptomatic versus not symptomatic side of things but the problem still exists so it's like by doing some acupressure you can probably take yourself down at that like acute stage where you're symptomatic and then continue to work on it mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah that makes sense yeah yeah, I like the acupressure. There's a lot of acupressure in my touch for health. Um, obviously, we didn't do acupuncture, um, but acupressure was a really big component of it. So acupressure, um, spinal reflexes, things like that, but acupressure holding points and acupressure was a large part of that. And I feel that it's very effective um, and that it's something that's quite simple to learn. Like you can literally Google like acupressure points for headache. Ta-da, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to pop up. Um, YouTube. Um, another good place to look for these acupressure points and how to, I mean, that would be a cool series for you to do actually, um, on reels or on YouTube, YouTube shorts, um, little acupressure holding points, maybe something to mm -hmm. look into for you. Anyways, I want to be respectful of your time and of our listeners time as well. I know for me, when I'm listening to a podcast, if it starts to go over 40 minutes, my brain starts to turn off. So <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about something else. So yeah. thank you guys so much for tuning in. And I'm excited to post this on YouTube. I think Logan and I are looking pretty cute today. So <laughs> thanks so much for hopping on the podcast on the show with me now. Um, yeah. Where can our listeners find you on the social medias? So Instagram, I'm just Logan.Grundy. Um, same with Facebook. If you just put in Logan Grundy, you're going to find me there. And then obviously on our webpage at healthpillars.ca, you'll be able to um, find my bio on there. And if you want to read up a bit more about me, or you can always um, send the applications in there to uh, get in touch with me. Yeah, absolutely. There is an apply link on our health pillars page and when you are filling out your application just make sure that you specify that you want to chat to logan and uh, he will put together a little video so how that kind of works just so our listeners anyone that isn't currently a client and is considering or thinking about being one um, no obligations when you submit an application form um, it just gives us the opportunity to kind of see where you're at and provide you a little bit more information about the programs and services that we offer. So if you submit an application with Logan's name on it, he will send you a personal video back going into some more detail um, around how he might be able to help you with your goals. So thank you so much for showing up here today, Logan. I appreciate you. And to the rest of you, peace, love, and personal growth. And we will catch you on the next episode.